one, two. The spoils. Good. You never will. You two town words, Sam. Hey, what's that? You call you? Fight it in Kodo. What's that gonna do with it? Yeah. I, I, I got him. So, the be happy about that one. They can't wait for me to come back to Stockton. Uh, ever since the Stockton fight, they've been asking me to come back. So, uh, I can't wait to go back to the city of Stockton and bid on a great fight and sell it out again. Absolutely, man. And I want to ask you this, too, since we're on the topic of, of our region that we're from. Um, you know, there's not a whole lot of big names, like you said, that have come out of our area. Um, so I want you to let the people out there know how hard it is to to get to come out of this area, because, you know, a lot of our fighters, I know they have to go to different cities. I know you moved to Vegas, you know, to get the sparring and the training and stuff. But let them know, you know, the struggles that we have up here, man. And it's, it's extremely hard. Uh, the odds are stacked against everyone, you know, to make it to the top. But it's even more stacked against us coming from Northern Cali just because it's a rough area. And we don't get a lot of shine. We don't get a lot of pop. We don't get a lot of credibility. You know, we don't really get a fair shake coming from Northern Cali. So that's why the odds are stacked against us more. It's harder for us to come up. You know, like you said, uh, we don't have a big stage, a big name like that out there. You don't really have that person to look up to near us. So that's why it's it's much harder and uh, for us out there. And yeah, I moved to Vegas because uh, I'm serious about my career. And like I said, I'm, I'm looking at the big picture and I know to make go further in my career, I would have had to make that change. I don't want to, I didn't want to move. I, I love Stockton. I felt comfortable in my city. I lived there all my 19 years uh, when I was there, all my 20 years actually. And so I didn't, I didn't want to move. And, but I, I had to move because I knew that was going to get me to the next level and that was going to have me do better. I honestly, honestly believe the performance you guys been seeing from me, the Belez performance and the ones previous, I've been doing better and getting better because uh, I put my mind to it in Vegas, man, and a lot of great sparring out here has helped me also. Absolutely, yeah. yeah I, I know a few uh, few of my buddies that turned pro, and uh, they did the same thing. A couple of them moved down south to get the sparring and stuff, so I, I know exactly what you mean, man. Um, but your performance, man, um, you looked good. You got the stoppage. Uh, was that something you were looking for to make a statement? All right. <laughs> I heard your question. You said, uh, did we plan on stopping uh, Velez, right? That was the question? Yes, right. sir. Um, we never plan on stopping somebody. We see it happening. We see it being very possible. But for us to go out there and get the stoppage, we just let it happen ourselves. Uh, if we get a stoppage, we believe it's because the great game plan in training camp. And that's what we had, a great game plan. Great training camp. And uh, tell you the truth, I didn't even follow up and do the game plan 100% how I should have. Okay. Honestly, um, Paz was telling me about it, and Paz is 100% right. Uh, I needed to float my jab more, use more feints. I needed to press more because he didn't have nothing for me. I was just taking my time. I was playing with my food. That's what I was doing. And uh, I could have really took advantage of so much more opportunities and press forward because when I walked forward, I hit him a lot. And uh, I was catching a lot of his punches on the inside. My, my defense was good right there inside of mid-range. So I could have uh, done a lot more. Uh, but um, we never looked for the stoppage. I, I just had a great feeling that we're going to get a stoppage. Even my uh, manager did, uh, Antonio Le uh, Jay Prince and Antonio Leonard. Uh, Antonio Leonard wa was telling me that uh, he put a bet. He, he bet knockout. You know, somebody else that helps us in the gym, uh, Ben, he hosts the show for me. Uh, he bet knockout, you know, so uh, and he convinced a couple of his people to bet knockout. So Ooh. they had good faith in me just because the training camp was just it was on another level, man. I was hungry, like I said, and I still am. Uh, I, that, that didn't really do nothing for me. I want more. So I just okay. feel like the stoppage and everything came through training camp. And so we never go out there looking for it. But it comes when you do everything correctly in the right way. What was this fight, you know, was Velez tougher than you thought he would be? Was he 
what you expected? Was it easier than you thought? Did you surprise yourself? It was tough for him, man. He's tricky. I didn't, from watching it on tape, he does not seem that crafty and tricky. He does not seem like it. But uh, when he's throwing, he's hard to counter going back. I was trying to counter, but he got his distance and he's very long. He, he looks like he's falling in and he's wide open, but in reality, he's really not. He's using his long arms and he's tucking his chin behind his shoulder. So he is kind of hard to counter going back. Going forward, countering forward was way more effective for me against Velez. So uh, I adjusted. I adjusted to him uh, fast. I made sure uh, to not let that throw me off my game plan because uh, that's the thing in pro boxing, man. You got to be ready for those adjustments because you never know how it's going to play on the fight. And we made quick adjustments and we made sure to counter going forward and press it to him a little more. That's how uh, we're going to get the job done better. And that goes to show everybody, don't underrest anybody through tape, you know, because you never know how it is going to be in the ring. It's always different in the ring. Yeah, most definitely, especially because, you know, and when you put yourself in Velez's shoes, he's like, this is my opportunity to get, to get back up there and get another title shot. You know what I mean? So he probably prepared for you and probably studied you just like you studied him. So a uh, great performance, man. Go ahead, Amilcar. Yeah. Well, first of all, congrats, Gabriel, on the great win. Um, you know, somebody had mentioned earlier that there were critics out there questioning your punching power, but you obviously displayed that you can knock somebody out. And I think that's actually something that should be expected as you get older and enter into kind of more your, your you know, mature strength as, as an athlete. But I want to kind of touch on what G-Funky was asking you about earlier just for those of, uh, that don't know you and your background, you just talk about like when you got into the sport, how you got into the sport, and how you decided to make the transition to pro boxing when you did from amateur boxing. Yeah, uh, I wanna I wanna uh, comment on the first part you're talking about. Of course, go ahead. Uh, critics talking about my power. Uh, they need to do more research, man. My pro debut, I got a stoppage, and it was a southpaw. It was tricky. I don't see so too many people having a pro debut with the southpaw. You know, that's a curveball they threw at me right there, but I handled it well. Uh, and the start the arena was about my 12th pro fight. I, I knocked old boy out, code. He didn't even get to catch himself on the floor. He was he was slumped already. He was lump. He was limp. And uh, I was young, man, learning on the job. I didn't fight in Mexico. I didn't go to TJ for a quick knockout or none of those. I fought here in the States since I was 17, since I turned pro. And uh, I was fighting Nevada and Texas, and Nevada is one of the toughest uh, commissions right there. So it was, it was, uh, it was tough. I was fighting real, real contenders, real people, not necessarily contenders, but real opponents. And they didn't have no upside down records, so that's why it was a little hard for me to get them out of there. I always had the power, but I was learning on the job, man. I was young, but now I'm getting comfortable. But uh, the the switch from amateur to pro, uh, I always had a pro style. Amateur growing up, sometimes I got robbed because I always had a pro style. They wanted me to throw more punches, even though I landed head snapping blows, and but I just threw less. Those kids threw more, but they didn't land nearly as much as I landed. So I would get robbed for that just because the amateur scoring. And uh, I didn't let that change my style. I didn't let that discourage me, and it didn't discourage my father. So we are ready for the pros, but we weren't looking to turn pro. The uh, deal actually came with us with the help of Rick Morrigan. Top rank was looking at us, and uh, I was only 16. I wasn't even thinking about going pro, but we know we dedicated our life to this, so we knew <clears throat> we we're ready, and we, we got a boxing style, so it's going to keep me safe, uh, not getting hit, not exchanging, so I knew I could do it just because of my fighting style too, and so we made the, we made the change, man, and like I said, I've just been learning on the job ever since I was 17 because I was 16 when I got signed. They sat me on the shelf a little bit because, like I said, I didn't want to take that route to fighting TJ and all that. I didn't want to take that route. I wanted uh, I didn't want to take no shortcuts. Not saying that other fighters are taking shortcuts doing that. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying what was my vision and our, me and my pops' game plan. Got it. And when you talk about your style, you speak about it very authoritatively, which I, I like. I like the confidence. What were your influences in terms of your boxing style, having that kind of a style so young? only had one influence, and that was Roy Jones Jr. Growing gotcha. up, man, I loved Roy. I loved watching him. I, when I was a kid, I was about five probably, even younger, man. Years, I grew up on boxing. I could watch boxing with my father, but I couldn't watch all 12 rounds. 
But when Roy came on, I watched every round and I did not take my eyes off the TV. Roy just was something different. He was special. He looked fluent in there. He looked like whatever he was doing, he was comfortable. No matter what situation he was in, he was comfortable. He looked comfortable. Like he was in control. And that's what I really liked. And then, uh, I liked his flashiness, his showboating. I liked all. I, li I liked everything about Roy. He, he was, he's for sure my favorite fighter of all time. So you like those lead right hands and those lead hooks? The yeah, mom. man. Yeah. Five and 14, something like that. But uh, I was national team for about four or five years. Uh, multiple time national champion as a senior. Um, I was I was an Olympic alternate in 2016. Kind of got shafted by the, by the politics in Canada. But, I mean, it is what it is. Uh, I'm meant for the pros. I got a pro. I got a professional style, and uh, yeah, that's that, that's where I'm at. Ten and zero as a pro, ten knockouts, and l looking to to further my career into the states. Yeah, I did hear you on uh, some other interviews about the politics of of Canada's amateur system, and uh, the unified champion Teofimo Lopez has expressed his frustration too. Now he's someone that didn't. Uh, qualify or make the Olympic team, and he did away with that. And he's sitting on top of the division, and this division is just stacked because I'm sure there's so many names. We'll get into the names and maybe um, see who you could see yourself with against. Most it's definitely. Funny, it's funny you mentioned that uh, because I was actually on a bus with Tiafimo sitting beside him in uh, in Venezuela in 2015 at the Continental Championships, and uh, I remember talking to him, and he he was he was fighting for Honduras at the time, right? And I remember talking to him and his dad was on the trip about what was happening with him on the American team. And, uh, yeah, it was funny that we were in, in the same situation at the time. Hey, Teofimo Sr. is no stranger to our radio network, the Leave It in the Ring radio network. He expressed and, and discussed the story on our, our uh, park podcast network. So, yeah, um, that's really interesting. But anyhow, tr you've now made the transition from amateur to professional and so people are probably interested in how you would self-describe your style. I mean, um, I thought I saw something about you describe yourself as Mexican, Mexican style, and you you fought in Mexico recently, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I I've had a, quite a bit of fights in Mexico, just to just because I'm hungry to get fights, right? I mean, like I I I started off my career fighting nine fights in nine months. So I was I was flying out the gate until uh, obviously it came to a stop. But once uh, last year March hit, right, and uh, boxing kind of went on a pause for I don't know, like until the summer, until top ranks started having their shows. But I'm I'm looking to stay busy in 2020. Uh, once I get my first fight out of the way in May, I I plan on fighting steady. Like I wanna I wanna keep busy. I mean, my fights don't last long anyway. Once I land some big shots, the fights the fights don't they, they don't carry on. It, that's just what it is. Yeah, I hear you. Um, you've, you're ten and zero. I mentioned that already with ten knockouts, consecutive knockouts. Do you do you find yourself in a predicament uh, with like Edgar, Edgar Berlanga Jr., who was prospect of the year last year? There's another kid we just interviewed, Jesus Ramos Jr. from uh, PBC. They're almost all knockout wins, and they're finding it a hard time to get people that are going to go rounds with them. Do you think that maybe you've been facing that in your professional career? Yeah, I mean, it's just one of those things. Like, uh, I mean, the the you got to properly get managed by 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 these guys and pick the right fights at the right time, right? I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of these top prospects, they you know. Sometimes they jump too soon. I mean, I'm I'm uh, I'm on the way of getting into that international or sorry into that uh, world class scene where I'm picking the right fights. Getting At the right ranked. time. Yeah, exactly. Getting ranked uh, and slowly making my way to the top. Uh, I mean, I I plan on making some big jumps this year, so it's gonna it's gonna be interesting uh, to see what happens in the future for me big fights man let's talk about some of these guys at 135 that you can see yourself fighting next year are are you a fan of any of them or are any of them guys that you're anxious to get in the ring with i don't really care who i fight i mean i'm a fighter i'm willing to fight anybody so it's just whatever whatever happens happens i mean whoever wants to fight i'm i'm ready to fight i'm open to fight any of them i don't really care whatever 
whatever my manager Phil wants. I mean, I'm I'm a fighter, so I'll be ready. With all the good fighters that came from Canada, like uh, Dallas Stevenson, uh, John Pascal, Lucian Butte, do you, any of them punt as a influence on your career? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I was I'm a huge fan of all, all three of them, especially Adonis. Uh, I mean, he was he was more my my t- type of fighter, right? Knockout artist. Uh, so I mean. Of course, I, I I looked up to those guys. Um, I want to follow it from from what they did, you know, winning world titles, stuff like that. The ring and potentially be Canada's next world champion. You envision that in the next two years, an opportunity for a world title fight? Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, I, I'm on my way there. I'm uh, I'm on the right track. I'm ten and zero, ten knockouts. Um, I mean, once it. it it's changed nowadays, you know, like guys are fighting for world titles at 14, 15, 16 and all. So in the next year or two, I'll, I'll, I'll be ready for that 100%. There you go. There you go. So you, get, you had that win over James Tony. Uh, what did that do in terms of your confidence uh, at that point as a fighter? Well, I, I, I got my confidence in 91 and 92. Mm-hmm. I was far Reggie Johnson. I sparred uh, uh, James Tony in 92. I sparred James the Heat Kitchen. So in 91, 92, I was sparring top dog, Vincent Durham. Uh, I was, so I was like, I was doing, you know, handling my, you know, my handling my own as an amateur with these guys. They was pros and world champs. So that's when I started getting my confidence. So were you in the the Midwest at this point? No, I was in LA. I left it. I left and moved to LA in uh, December 90. There you go. There you go. And my whole amateur career was out of base out of LA. Got you. Got you. So you had those those wins over over Tony. And um l- let's talk about the night uh that, that I started out here with at the Taj Mahal casino live on HBO. I remember watching that as a kid. Can you can you talk about like leading up to that fight? I mean it was man, it was just a great experience. Man, I had over like 30, 40 people from Chicago who came out and supported me. Um, everything was just beautiful. I, I felt good going into the fight. I was in I was in tip top shape. I was ready. Uh, you know the James Tony fights. I beat one of the best middleweights ever in history, two times. I, I was ready for Roy Jones. Uh, he was a fast guy, fastest guy I've ever been in the ring with. Uh, that that kind of threw me off a little bit because uh, I spar bantamweights up to heavyweight, and uh, for this man to be so fast, I'm like, man, I got to keep my eyes open. I threw like a little lazy jab, and he hit me with a right hand over the top. So fast, I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, this dude, I ain't never seen anybody this fast. So I had to keep my eyes open. And I, what I what I did, I tried to match his speed. I'm not saying I'm faster than him or just as fast as him, but I matched his speed as far as counter punching and defense and everything. And it, and it was very successful for me. Gotcha. So you won your world title. I'm sure it was a little bit uh, bittersweet uh, given how it happened, but obviously, tremendous accomplishment. And Look, what I want the fans to realize is your career is obviously far, uh, goes far beyond uh, that fight and that moment. I mean, you fought Darius Michalszewski, a guy that Roy didn't fight, right? You you fought, uh, obviously, you got those big two wins against um, against James Tony. You fought Derek Harmon and beat him. Uh, I mean, you, you were fighting some top dudes out there. You fought Antonio Tarver, obviously. Uh, Jose Cesar Gonzalez was, had a big record when you fought him. Babu Chubinov, a guy who who made a lot of noise in the light heavyweight division. Can you just talk about some of your toughest fights, uh, Montel? Uh, you know, I uh, I just you know, it's a few fights. I just, just you know, I don't want to be negative about it, but a few fights just didn't go my way. Um, when I fought Mikaszewski in Germany, man, I was beating this man easy every round, every round. If you look at the video. Joe Cortez stopped the fight for no reason. It was it was BS. Um, he got paid off without a doubt. I don't care about starting arguments or rumors. Joe Cortez got paid off. He stopped the fight for no reason. I was beating the man easy. You know what I'm saying? As far as Tava, it was a great, great fighter. Um, I got caught in the back of the head in the first round. I tried my best. I still I was I'm I'm proud of myself for going 11 rounds with a concussion. So thing, you know, that things didn't go my way, but it is what it is. As far as uh who's the who uh uh, Julio Gonzalez, I'll make no excuses. Uh, 
I fought him on Cinco de Mayo, which I don't know why Al Hammond would even uh, have me fighting this man in California on Cinco de Mayo. I wasn't going to win if I didn't knock him out. So it's just part of my game, man. But it is what it is. Yeah, and that's the other the other side of the sport, right? I mean, a guy that you fought as well, another great fighter, Glenn Johnson. I mean, that's something he knows a lot about as well, but obviously you had that experience in that fight too, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and you read the book. You see what I – but I went to the dressing room and told him. I said, I said, what did you find that found the youth? And he put his head down. I knew then he was cheating, and I walked right out. <laughs> yeah. I, I ain't, I ain't got to make no excuse. I'm telling people what happened. I walked in his dressing room after our fight. I said, what did you find the fountain of youth? And he put his head down. And I left out because he was two years older than me. And he had too much energy. Someone right. But it is what it is. No, it is not. Let me ask you about the elephant in the room, which is Caleb Plant. You know, I know you guys have had beef like two years. And uh, it, it seemed to have started in that, that gym that day when uh, Jose confronted him. And then uh, Caleb Plant tried to hit him. I don't know if he did connect with them, uh, but David obviously grabbed uh, Jose. Um, what are your guys' thoughts that he's saying he needs to get his mandatories out of the way so he could unify with Canelo Alvarez? Is that is that a sign that he's saying he doesn't want to fight with you guys? Uh, you know, this is uh, so hopefully all the people are watching, you know. Man, we really want to get that fight. We already have problems, so... We, we, that's the fight we, we've we been trying to make for almost two, three years, man. All the excuses that he says, oh, he's not a champ. Oh, he's not at my level. Oh, fuck the belt, man. Let's make that fight. Let's make that fight. Don't, let's not fight for your belt. Let's just make that fight. That's the fight that people want to see. I think he's a really good fighter. I think he's a very dangerous fighter. I think that's a tough fight, you know? But in order to make history, in order to go to the next level, we need to fight those guys, you know? We need to, you know? I mean, I'm not, I'm, I mean, I'm happy that we're fighting Ronald Ellis, but really, he's not at that level, you know, to be honest, you know, I, right. I think David's supposed to look good, he's supposed to take him out and look impressive in order to go keep progressing, you know, but we need the Charlos, we want the Charlos, we want the uh, the Caleb Plants, you know, uh, in, in order to get to Canelo, you know, we don't care about the money, we don't care about titles, you know, we care about making history, man, we care about leaving a legacy in boxing in order to do that you gotta fight fighters that are up there you know a fight uh, a level fighters you know right right so that's, that's, that's the one that we want to fight we never dodge nobody we want to fight all of them and i mean because we are ready and, and and if i didn't believe that what are we what are we doing in this game you know we, we like i said money does not matter money is not everything in life history legacy is what we're looking for you know absolutely speaking about Jamar Charlo, he had said in an interview uh, just a while back that he, it, moving up at six, 168, your son's name was brought up and he said he could knock him out. That, you know, uh, early or late, it doesn't matter. It's going to happen. He will eventually happen. He will knock him out. What are your thoughts about that, man? Oh, man, I love that fight. That's another dangerous fight that we're willing to take, man. That that will be a pay-per-view fight, like I said, because it's, it's so big that people want to see that fight. Uh, man, you know, uh, we're excited. I already uh, called our promoter uh, and let, and we talked about, yeah, let's make this fight happen. Do everything you can. He wants to fight. We want to fight. I, I, it should be an easy fight to make. Uh, he's, he's a gangster. You know, he, 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 he doesn't run from nobody either. So he's a talented fighter, a really uh, good fighter, you know, up there that, you know, um, I think we could beat him. Uh, I think uh, it's not going to be easy, but that's the, those are the fights that people want to see, man, and we want to bring those fights to the people. So we already reached out to our promoter, and uh, hopefully he's uh, serious about what he's saying, and we can make that fight. I mean, to me, that's bigger than uh, Caleb Plan. That's bigger than uh, any other fight, I think. And then whoever does good is going to go to the next level and keep fighting those other fighters, bro. Whoever, you know, out of this winners will beat anybody, you know? Because then, then we can show a little bit more of what we have, you know? You, you know, Jose, you know, obviously, I think me and you are like around the same age, you know? Um, so we obviously have been following the sport for a very long time. And I, I've always spoke to about people about, like, if they just fought, if they just decided to fight whoever was available, the big money would eventually come. So it sounds to me, you don't need a, you guys don't need a title. You don't need none of this. If Charlo decides to jump up, you guys are willing to take this fight immediately, right? Let me tell you something. You know what I tell people, right? Dude, don't think about the money. Money will come. 
you know, eventually money will come. They focus on on, on 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 fighting the good people, you know. After that, everything's gonna fall in your feet, man. But don't think about the money, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to show the people what we have. We gotta beat this good fighter, and then after that, money will come. But we're not focused on money. We're focused, like I said, legacy, legacy, legacy is what we want. Uh, you know, we want to live, uh, uh, break records. We want to make history. You know, we want to go to the Hall of Fame. In order to do that, money's not going to take you there. Fighting good people is going to take you there. You know, so I think that that's what we're trying to look for. Belts and all that. You know, like I said, uh, Caleb Frank can keep his belt. We'll fight him. You know, just for to fight him because we want to kick his ass. That's the only thing. You know, right? Imagine that once we uh, beat uh, Caleb Plant. Then, you know, we go to Charlo, and then probably we could go to Canelo. But I'm not even thinking about fighting uh, Canelo right now, you know? Uh, Canelo will not fight David, you know? He wants to fight guys that are kind of like having their last fight, you know? And I don't blame him. They're doing a good job about that, you know? I mean, he's in a good position. Uh, but I don't even think he's going to fight Caleb Plant because Caleb Plant moves a lot, you know? He will have problems with Caleb Plant, you know? His right. knees, uh, uh, Canelo's knees are not 100%. You don't, I don't think he wants to chase a Caleb plan, you know? Uh, so I even bet a fight with David will be even more interesting because David's going to come to Canelo, you know? That's going to be a war right there too, you know? So at the end of the day, those are the fights that Canelo's looking for. Somebody that comes to him, some not, somebody that's going to run away from him, you know? Uh, because Leonard Ellerby is a completely different type of manager. He likes to be in front of the camera or he likes to be he likes being very vocal with his opinions. OK, now Tank Davis is a name that was immediately brought up after your fighter uh, getting that KO of the year. Uh, fans are saying they want to see this fight happen. Then Ellerby tweets out two fans saying um, Oscar's too little. You guys complain about Santa Cruz, blah, 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 blah. What's your, what's your thoughts about what a manager intervenes like that? Rather, when, I th when I'm thinking of a manager should do, should welcome anything because their job is to make fights for their fighter with the most money. Do you think that's like putting your foot in your mouth as a manager or kicking yourself in the ass by accident when you intervene like that and possibly kill a possible showdown between your fighter and his? I mean, that's a good question. And honestly, uh, I think um, to me, it, it came across, maybe he didn't want to come across, but it came across like he was intimidated by, you know, there's a new, you know, someone at the top of the level that was kind of, you know, uh, next to Tank. So it, it sounded like he was more intimidated. I, I totally understand that as a manager, you're supposed to defend your fighter uh, and speak on it. But, you know, I think that they, they, they didn't come across, uh, my, my opinion, they kind of came, came across intimidated. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, listen, as you said, Oscar Valdez needs a dance partner. Tank Davis needs a dance partner. Uh, at the end of the day, these, fan, these fans want to see these type of big fights. Uh, our history, you know, as you know, uh, with Israel Vasquez, Marquez, Abner Morris, and, you know, the, the Bantamweight and all that stuff, like, we don't shy away from big fights. So uh, we, we are excited, you know, when to, to, to be in the talks and give the fans what they want to see. Absolutely, man. A milk cart? No, I, I would actually ask for your thoughts on Shakur, but I, you're a very professional guy, and I probably wouldn't, uh, I don't want to, like, get you to say something just because I, I think it, but I, I honestly don't think that Shakur has done anything to deserve a fight with, with yeah. uh, Valdez. Um, well, I mean, he's, he did I agree. pretty much nothing at Ooh. 126. You do so. You do agree with that, there, Frank? Is that Shakur hasn't done anything to get in there with Oscar? Well, he really hasn't. Uh, that's just a fact. I mean, I I think that Shakur Stevenson is honestly a, a great fighter. Uh, we went up against him with uh, Joe Gonzalez, so I have a lot of respect for him. I mean, right. he's obviously gonna has a bright future, um, but to say that he's deserving of a shot or anything like that, uh, I would totally disagree. Uh, I know that Oscar Valdez was at featherweight. Uh, for seven years, you know, and I think, you know, uh, Stevenson was only there for, I don't know, maybe two, two, one year, maybe one year. I don't know. Hmm. I really don't know, but he wasn't there for a very long time. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, at, at, even though I feel that a fight between him and Oscar Valdez is, you know, will happen, I, I, I do feel that's going to happen because that's a fight that we are very interested in. 
uh, at the end of the day, he's not in a position to demand certain fights. Uh, he's kind of in the opponent's side right now, and he's got to work his way up. Um, but we look forward to fighting Stevenson in the near future. So let me, you know, let me ask you what I'm going to, I'm going to give you some names and tell me which ones are the more like more approachable and more realistic in the making, making happen on the table of the negotiation table. Uh, Shakur Stevenson, Tank Davis, Jamal Herring, and Andrew Cancino. <clears throat> um, I think they're all realistically i i i feel that stevenson uh jamal harry and Concio or Concio is uh is a um realistic fight uh, i don't know I, we would we would totally be interested in tank davis uh i just feel sometimes that they just have a uh you know their their promotion has a, a totally different agenda um i know that tank davis just from his short history he's called out lomachenko Ryan Garcia. At the end of the day, that none of these fights have actually happened. Right. And, and uh, I don't want to, you know, waste my time either and, and talk about something that, you know, you know, get the fans up to excited about something that's possibly may not happen. Right. Now, if they're interested, they know they've been around the, uh, the business. You know, they obviously make an offer. You know, talk to top rank and, and uh, you know, let's go from there. One. Good. He never was. Two time world champ. Eight point five Kodo. Fighter than Kodo. Nothing to do with it. Three point four champ. Yeah. I ain't got a shit.